I'm Dave Burkus. They call me Mr. Trend, and you're watching Eye on Business. Everybody, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report and for Ion Business. Each time we talk, I have a chance to tell you stories about entrepreneurs who have succeeded wildly or even failed miserably and the lessons that we've learned from those entrepreneurs and their stories. I've combined all of these together into books that I've written. But really, the basis for all of this is tell me a good story because I have a short attention span. So, my mantra is lessons of a lifetime and 140 characters or less. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to tell you stories of entrepreneurs who have made it or failed and why and what we learned as a lesson. I put these into books. They're called uh, Basic Birkonomics, Birkonomics, and Advanced Birkonomics. They're available everywhere. But here come some of the stories that give you an idea. So here are a few of the stories that I've got. Here is Steve Street. Steve came to the Tech Coast Angels, our investment group, our angel investment group, in 1999, right before the crash, and said, I have an idea. My friends and I are trying to buy things on the Disney website or on any website like Amazon, and those of us that don't have credit cards find ourselves unable to buy things on the Internet. Why don't we create a card that looks like a credit card that you can pay in advance? Does this sound suspiciously like a debit card? Steve Street invented the debit card industry. And in fact, his company, Green Dot, grew to a size where it's one of those giant companies that we like to talk about. It went public on the New York Stock Exchange in the year 2011. It dominates the debit card industry. And I was lucky to be the largest investor in that first round. So here's a story. I think the moral of this story is kind of obvious. Management quality trumps a quality plan. Think about it for a second. He tried to describe buying things on the Internet. And Green Dot, you know from the 75,000 stores you see it in, is the banking system for the unbankable. What a difference. And how that company has grown into be worth over billions because of that change in the philosophy of how it worked. Here's another story. I led a deal with angel investors putting in $6 million, a very, very large amount for angel investors. And it was a clothing company run by a woman and the clothing company promised that if you, as a customer, would give us between 3 and 12 of your measurements, uh, the system would take those measurements, create a store for you that was unique to your fit, and guarantee to fit you and flatter you. And that guarantee would mean that sometimes we had to use skirts of a different size than blouses. In dresses, we had to change sizes. We had to mismatch inventory. And so my question to her during the initial due diligence was, what do you do with the inventory? How do you build an inventory that makes any kind of sense? Well, she said, don't worry about it. As we grow, the designers and manufacturers will ship directly, and that won't be our problem. Well, can you guess that venture capitalists came in with another $32 million? We built this business up, but it continued to lose money until it finally failed. Do you know what the reason, the main reason why it failed is? Yes, indeed. You have to believe your gut. You have to know. That if you ask a question, like in this case, what about the inventory? And your gut tells you there's something wrong with the answer, maybe you go with your gut and believe that gut and do what you need to do. A good lesson for all of us. Here's another one. This is a company that I helped to form after selling my hotel computer company. And it was before the age of digital telephones. In fact, I just gave away the punchline by accident. We had a way of putting a telephone, a cell phone, into every hotel room connected to that room phone through a switch in the basement. What it meant was when the hotel's room phone would ring, this digital, I mean, excuse me, this analog cell phone would ring. And so we had a tent card that said, take this phone, put it in your person pocket, go anywhere in the city, on the golf course, anywhere you want, and you won't miss any more calls to your room. 
Now, you and I laugh at that today because we all have phones that roam anywhere in the country. But back in those days, a roaming plan cost a lot of money, and roaming minutes were a dollar per minute. So it was a great idea. In fact, we even told people that if they wanted to make an outgoing call, which used to be very expensive in a hotel phone, just use that same phone and make the outgoing call. Turns out that we routed it through that same switch in the basement, and every hotel became a telephone company. What a great idea. Until we saw the full-page ad for digital phones from all these phone companies. For $40, you could get a digital phone. Its payment plan allowed you $40 a month, and you could roam with a selected number of minutes anywhere in the country. As those leases for those hotels, and there were many four- and five-star hotels, including Ritz-Carlton's, that had these leases, every one of them, when the lease was up, called us and said, take back your phones, take out your system. And what we learned by a company that crashed and lost a lot of money was, well, let me ask you the question. Weren't there maybe 10,000 people or more in this country that would have known the answer before I even ask it, that would have known that digital telephones were coming? And we, who didn't, spent all this money building a system based on analog phones that became obsolete with that one full-page ad. So the moral of that story is, know your market before committing resources. And I think there's one that I think <laughs> sits well for all of us. This is a story that I've told before. It's about a garage-based business that grew well, but because the investors decided to change the way that business looked, the business failed. And the question was always, whether or not the board made the business fail as opposed to the entrepreneur because it was successful under the entrepreneur. Then, I'd like you to meet Adam Miller. Adam came to Los Angeles right at the beginning of the year 2000, right around the time of the crash, and he had an idea. And he and a partner in, I understand, the bedroom of a home, created what turned out to be Cornerstone On Demand, the sales force of HR software, if you want to look at it that way. And Cornerstone went public uh, a couple of years ago. It's one of those unicorns we love to talk about that's worth over a billion dollars today. But Adam built that company right in front of us from scratch and did such a good job of doing it, it makes you believe that there's a moral in that story, too. And the moral is, yes, it is most often the jockey and not the horse. Adam was able to make and still is the CEO of that company, make a company grossly successful. Here is Hipmunk. Hipmunk is a very successful online travel agency, and has done it by making a unique form of, uni of, of user interface that allows you to tell the length of a flight and the agony of a flight just by looking at a graph. A very, very good company in a marketplace that you would have thought would have been entirely mature. And so the answer to that one was you can build a company based on a better mousetrap. Here's one where I have no picture, so I uh, just want to tell you a fast story. Right before the crash, an entrepreneur came to us, somebody we knew well, and said, I want to make an incubator. And we, many of us, invested $25,000, and then the crash, just months later. And he realized almost instantly that there'd be no way during that period, and there were going to be two or three years to go before that period was over, that we could invest in tiny entrepreneurial companies and still be able to make any money. He gave back 96% of the money that we gave him to build that business. The only money he spent was for the attorneys to build a business. And do you know that after that crash, for the next two and a half or three years, that was the best return that I had? And that lesson is a good one. Fail fast. If you see something change from what you thought it should be and you can't pivot, and in this case he couldn't, fail fast. His return of that money was something that made us all happy. And I said we got back about 95% of all of our money. Well, here's a picture that reminds me of a story that I just have to kind of tell you. That letter, which is fading from the screen now purposely, was a letter that I received in 1995 from an employee that was the head of my programming for the hotel computer company that I owned and managed. And he wanted to be a marketing person. He left me in 1990 because I wouldn't let him be a marketing person. He was the chief programmer and had 26 people reporting to him and thousands of hotels dependent upon him. In 1995, the letter you just saw disappear from the screen shows up in my email box. And I memorized it, <laughs> and now you'll know why. He said, hello again, Dave. I am employee number seven at a Seattle-based internet retail startup called Amazon.com. His name was Tom, Tom Shonoff, and he was the director of marketing for Jeff Bezos' brand new company. And he was writing me in the very first two weeks. 
And he described the process about he and Jeff and the other five employees, how they stop at 1 o'clock and they'd pack all the books and get them ready for the post office. But he said, my founder, Jeff, is in round two of capital seeking, the term he used, and if you'd like to invest, I'm sure that he'll take your money. Well, I wrote him back. I had 10 rules at the time, and I thought those were really good rules, and I'm in Southern California, and the rule number one was businesses in California, or at least in Southern California, where I could make a difference by helping to coach those entrepreneurs. So I wrote Tom, and I said, gee, Tom, great to hear from you. Keep me informed. Now I have to ask the question that I love to ask when I'm doing this little speech about that particular company and that particular event. If you were in that stead, what would you do? If two years later you found out that Amazon's public offering would have made that 100000 worth $33 million, and a year after that, $66 million, and here's the one that somebody who was in the audience a few months ago looked up Amazon's current price and saw that they hadn't taken any more outside money since that time. They had done it all with inside money. That if you had held on to that and just relayed on the stock price and nothing else, that 100000 would be worth $2 billion today. Well, the lesson is on the screen. Some will get away, and there's no way that you can't laugh at those kinds of failures, even if you're smiling at your successes. So that really is my punchline today to smile at your successes, but to learn how to laugh at your failures. You're going to have them. It's obvious. And for those of us who invest in you, we can do the same if you can do the same. It isn't bad for you to fail if you've learned something important like the lessons we've talked about today. Well, thanks for watching. This is Dave Burkus for Eye on Business and the Burkus Report. everybody, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Ion Business. Each time we talk, I have a chance to give you insights into how to manage your business, perhaps how to make marketing better, how to manage your employees, or sometimes, like today, we're going to talk about how to manage your mantra. A mantra is a very short sentence that says who you are and what you do. And people will remember you for your mantra far longer than they'll remember you for anything else. And so if you don't mind today, I'm going to delve, delve, or delve into my own story by telling my own mantra. So tell me a story, because I have a short attention span. And so that's what we're going to do today. In fact, today we're going to talk about my own story. Here's a story of my life that starts from the beginning that kind of describes who I am and gives you a chance to say, in your terms, how you are as well. So 57 years ago, 1958, Whoa. I started my first business at the age of 16 in the bedroom of my home. In fact, here I am at that 16 age, building a recording studio that became a record company that became a public company in Hollywood. So how did all that happen and how did that lead to where I got into the computer business? It's an interesting story and I'll tell it very fast. So from that little tiny studio that I put together from parts that I cobbled together from many places, I was able to work my way through college, here I am as a sophomore in college, with the company car, operating the business every day of the week as I ran my way through college. And at the end of my college time, I was making about $300,000 in gross with 52 independent contractors and no employees, farming out the entire source of supply. That meant that I, at that time, was giving away a great piece of the gross profit to other people. As soon as I graduated from college, the very first thing I did was to build my company for real. And it didn't take three years to have enough money to begin to build a building, which we did, hire my first real employee rather than independent contractors, and get down to the business of vertically integrating, a term that we use to say buying and building the sources of supply. So I did just that, taking the company to Hollywood within another three years, outgrowing that office building. And in fact, in Hollywood, we built the West Coast, and perhaps the industry's only complete facility in one building. You could walk in the door, record in the studio if you chose, bring us your tape if you didn't, and a week later walk out from the same building with no other materials coming into the building but vinyl pellets and uh, vinyl materials, and have a finished phonograph record album at the time. 
It was amazing. I loved the business. It was the technology of the day because computers hadn't yet been invented. Well, not quite, because in 1971, I bought the very first MAI Basic 4 computer, serial number 4, and programmed it myself. I had such fun doing that that I built programs for manufacturing resource control, as well as accounts receivable, accounts payable, payroll, all those programs. And the salespeople for the hardware company began to see that I was the only early user of their mini computer that had made a successful program that worked. And they began bringing people in and letting me give demonstrations to them. It didn't take long at all before I realized that there was more money in these programs that I had written for my own company than in the company itself. So by that time, I'd taken the company public, I sold the company, sold my interest in the company, and went into the computer programming business, settling on programming for hotels. And at that time, programming for hotels, we were there as the second or third entrant into an industry that had no automation at the time, giving us a chance to build 16% of the entire automated hotels of the world, as well as 22% of the automated hotels in the United States. I love to tell the story that even today, 22 years later, or is it even more than that, Marriott Corporation still uses 3,500 of those systems that I wrote in 1971 through 1981, and uh, they leased in, in 1981. It's a wonderful story of how some of these old programs still happen. The company was an Inc. 500 company, twice, and did well for all of us, and I sold the company in 1990. In fact, there's a story there. I sold the company when I realized when all of my, company, my employees celebrated the 50th birthday, my 50th birthday, by wearing black, that maybe perhaps it was time for me to move on. An unintended consequence, I'm certain, for them, at the same time as it gave a real opportunity for me to rethink the third phase of my life. And that was hearing the angel's call, or deciding that I wanted to be an angel investor. However, back in those days, 1993, the term angel investor hadn't yet been invented. And so you see in the background the book that I wrote in 1993 called Better Than Money that tried to describe what I called resource capitalism that later became angel investing. And on the right side of the screen, you see Inc. Magazine in 1996 calling me a super angel. It was the first time that the word super angel had ever been used, and a very, very early time that the word angel had been used. And they just uh, thought of it in terms of a nice thing to say. And so Inc. Magazine might be credited for popularizing the term angel investing. Well, it was very easy from there to move on. And so, since that time, 1993, I've seen 7,000 business plans. I have invested in 137 of those companies, 86 of them second rounds. I've had 17 liquidity events, meaning positive liquidity events where I've made money, and 29 where I didn't, and 91 companies that still, to this day, continue in their business. My internal rate of return is almost 100%, it's 97% per year, like doubling a penny. And if you take away one very big one, it's 80%. And if you take away all of the angel investments, or at least you then give the money to the bank, it's down to 23%. So it says that there's been a lot of money made in angel investing, but four of those investments account for 90% of all the money I have ever made. It's a lesson for angel investors and venture capitalists. It doesn't take many. In fact, it only takes one or two to make everything happen. So. Here comes a few stories that teach my mantra, lessons of a lifetime in 140 characters or less. So lesson number one, all of these have been put into my books, the Birkenomics books, where I have over 100 of these lessons in each one of the three books about Birkenomics that I've written at this time. So let's talk about the first one. Might be the end. Oh, I'm not telling stories. I'm sorry. Can, I, can we edit into the end? In this one, the stories come in the future ones. Okay. Okay, so let me uh, put a new ending on it if I can. Okay, can you leave that one up and we'll be fine. I'm sorry about that. And so you have just heard in five minutes maybe my story. You've heard my mantra, lessons of a lifetime in 140 characters or less, and you understand more about me. Now, five minutes was a very long time, but at least the mantra gives you an idea that Birkenomics, my tagline, my mantra as it is, is something that I hope you'll remember. At the same time as, it's time for you to think about yours. Have you done something that makes the reputation for you? 
Have you done something that gives other people a chance to know with just a few words who you are? It's worthwhile for you to think about that for a while, not just for yourself, but for your company as well. Is there a mantra that names your company the same way that you'd be naming yourself? It's a great exercise, it's worth doing, and I look forward to seeing some of these mantras over time and certainly hope that you develop one that people do remember and smile when they hear. This is Dave Burkus for Ion Business and the Burkus Report. Good evening. This is David Friedman, uh, Street Savvy Marketing segment of Ion Business. Now, I want to welcome Andrew Bermudez to our uh, viewers tonight. Andrew's normally on the other side asking the questions. I'm going to turn it around on him tonight and ask questions of Andrew. Andrew was a senior vice president of Lee & Associates, has been in the commercial real estate space for a while, but left the corporate world to start a business called Digsy. So, Andrew, welcome, and uh, tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is pretty exciting. I'm a little uh, taken aback because now you're asking the question. So yeah, I love that. Sure. Yeah. No, I appreciate you putting me in the hot seat like that. Um, yeah, starting the business, uh, do you want to go back to commercial real estate, or are you looking for specifically for Digsy? Well, I'm really thinking about Digsy. How did you come up with the idea of Digsy? Sure. So, um, it, it's... Idea extraction, right? You and being in commercial real estate, uh, you see the problems. You know, being on the brokerage side, managing people, you see a lot of inefficiencies. And if you ask anybody out there, what you'll find out is that um, there really isn't a lot of technology that people have adopted. Uh, but the ones that are afflicted the most, actually, the business owner, the person looking for commercial real estate, whether it is to buy or to sell, or buy, sell it, or uh, lease it out. Uh, so, in that process, what I found out was uh, being a broker and then step, uh, as I started my company, trying to find commercial real estate is really tough and it's uh, mainly due because uh, the, there isn't an MLS in commercial real estate like there is in residential. There's a bunch of mm -hmm. little uh, companies and some publicly traded which their number one asset is listings. So they don't share. Uh, in residential is much different so you have to search different listing sources to do that. Uh, it's really hard to, when you call and something's already been leased or somebody will tell you it's been leased, uh, you know, for a year on end. And uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to make the experience a, a lot easier for an entrepreneur. It's a lot different. Go ahead. Right. Well, no, I was just, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, um, this consultancy I started. I'm now looking for real estate. Let's assume that I'm going to grow this into a larger business, right? And now how do I use your product to find me the ideal location? Like with a river view. Yeah, sure. And that's, that's, a tough, that, that's a hard thing, right? If you were to go into a search engine and you said, I want a river view, how do you, where do you type that in? Right? You actually need to, Yeah, <laughs> right. You can't do that. So uh, essentially what Digsy allows you to do is allows you to automate your search for real estate. It's a combination of technology and then we have local market experts who know the property so they know if it has a river view or not, right. who will curate those listings for you. So as opposed to you actually go in and filtering out listings on your own, spending an hour, calling brokers, all that. You can just tell Digsy what you want, go back to work, and then within a few hours, we'll have all those Riverview places for you. And you just tell us which ones you want to go see, and we set everything up for you. So it's almost like having your own butler to find commercial real estate. But this is not like when you say D ask Digsy, I'm thinking... Here it is, a voice coming out of the internet and telling me. Do you have that planned in, as part of your, uh, your uh, MVP? We uh, don't talk about future products. Ah, okay. <laughs> so we'll, let's stay in the here and now in the yeah. present. What are some of the business issues that you face with Digsy? Yeah, so that's actually an interesting thing. So uh, most commercial, because we're a technology company, commercial real estate, what well, you find uh, a lot of commercial real estate companies that are in technology trying to innovate, it's really hard to get the brokers to adopt the technology. A lot of them still use fax machines. Uh, a lot of them, I mean, it's a surprise that still, you know, email has made such a big dent in there. Um, and a lot of them just still use the telephone. Right. So trying to get them to use either a web application or anything like that is really, really tough. So what we ended up doing uh, at Digsy is we sort of um, said if we wanted minimum friction, what do we have to do? And we use email. We use uh, tools that route into our systems. We do give them an easy-to-use dashboard, but they don't even have to log in. They actually just, everything's driven via text message or email, and we make it really easy for them to not have to adopt the technology. The technology just comes to them. On the okay. consumer side, it's been a lot easier. Uh, a lot of people are used to being web-based, and a lot of our customers, they've already spent hours 
calling brokers, they've been uh, trying to get a hold of the broker, that's the number one complaint, that they lob a phone call, they leave a voicemail, or they shoot an email, they don't hear back. We eliminate that uh, annoyance and that inconvenience for an entrepreneur. At the end of the day, it sounds exciting to move in a, new in a new space, but really you're running a business, so you really should be in front of customers, recruiting, fundraising, whatever it is, and okay. we allow them to get that time. So, so let's talk about something. I've, I've always had this model in my head of a combination of IQ, intelligence, and in, in, innate intelligence, EQ, or emotional quotient, emotional intelligence, and BQ. Now, the focus is on being street savvy. What does street savvy mean to you from a Digsy point of view? Have you done anything really unique, uh, innovative, street savvy to get Digsy e either off the ground or into the mainstream? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, there was actually, when you used to be involved with Techos Angels, I'm not sure if you are anymore. Still am. Uh, great. Uh, there's a company called Don't Transcepta. Don't ask me for money on the show, though. <laughs> um, so Ray Parsons, who's uh, with Transepta, funded by Techos Angels, had taught me uh, about EQ. And right. the interesting thing is I used to think I had it because being in commercial real estate, you're in sales and you deal with people. What I was really, I was really immature in that, in that sense. And I think the biggest thing uh, that EQ for me has meant is, you know, you've got the pragmatic side of the business, uh, right. which you want to back up with data. You always want to back up your intuition with data, data, data. So you may have right. a good idea, but at the same time, just measure, measure, measure. That's the one thing I've learned about that side. Um, the EQ really comes into team building. And uh, you, I don't think that you can build a business without having just a phenomenal, intelligent team, but most importantly, that culturally fits. So if somebody drops the ball, there's somebody behind them already catching it. Um, and being you know, CEO of a company, you catch yourselves not having certain characteristics um, that you think you have. And what I figured out is that on the EQ side, it's really just putting yourself in people's shoes. And it's a lot harder than we think, especially for a type A personality. So it's been a lot of reading. It's been a lot of things. But at the end of the, the day, I think the biggest innovation was to really uh, work with uh, trying to support the team and trying to recruit people who had recruit more for aptitude and cultural fit than it is for actual skill set. All right. So let's talk about three business lessons you learned. I mean, let's, you've gone through this, you've built Digsy for a little while, uh, it's gaining traction. What are the three learnings that you have? How can you, can you share those with the viewing audience? Sure. Uh, so before Digsy, we had a previous product uh, that had traction and we had some idea to monet, uh, how to monetize it. And when we tried monetizing it, um, it didn't quite work. There were just too many layers that right. made it, uh, that just fragmented that. So we went back to the drawing board. Uh, looking back, I think the lesson that we, uh, we literally started Digsy with the same technology, but we basically worked with a spreadsheet and a phone call to call tenants and find out if they needed help finding space. And then after that, we developed the technology. So uh, we thought we were being lean. I think that you really need to talk to your customers. And we were talking to our customers, but we probably did it about 80% of the time. I think that you should do it about 100% 20% of the time okay. to make sure your business will work. So you have talking to customers. What's one more? Give me one more uh, learning that you have. Yeah. Uh, have really, really good people around you. Uh, well, that goes with the team structure you it just does. talked about. It does. It teams everything. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. From a Tech Coast Angels point of view, we look at the business and we look at the, what we call the jockey or the team. And it's not only the CEO, but it's also the, uh, the executive team and the board of advisors. You know, I really appreciate you coming in and taking time out of your busy day. I know you have to run off to do another, uh, <laughs> another uh, gig tonight, <laughs> and I appreciate that. I just want to thank you, Andrew Bermudez, uh, CEO and founder of Digsy, and I'm David Friedman for our street-savvy business on Ion Business. Have a very good evening.